Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Welcome everyone to our weekly Redefining Medicine podcast. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Lesgarten, a microbiome research scientist at the Gene Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today, Dr. Lesgarten. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, I am very excited to get started. While gaining your PhD in physiology from the University of Texas Health Science Center, you studied the impact of oxidative stress on muscle mass and function during aging. Can you provide us with a look into the personal journey that led you to study this topic and subsequently where you are today? Yeah, sure. So that's a bit of a long story. And uh, so I've always been interested in health and fitness. I grew up on like uh, bodybuilding magazines and going to the gym when I was like 13, always want, wanting to be fit and lean and ripped. So then, you know, I went off to college, you know, graduated, whatever. Uh, but my focus was not health and fitness at that, at that point, but still, you know, keeping myself fit and healthy on my own personal time. But then after my first college degree, I basically went five years not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. And just one day going to Barnes and Noble and hanging out there, I picked up a book by uh, Roy Walford called Beyond the 120 Year Diet, which was basically, you know, a, a story of calorie restriction and how the animal data for calorie restriction at that time, well, 20 years ago, showed an extension of lifespan. Um, so uh, once I once I picked that up and I also had an interest in biochemistry, with the, with the idea that, you know, aging and disease is a biochemical process that happens for decades. And it isn't, you know, it isn't something that, that just pops up and then you're just sick and diseased one day. So if you study your own biochemistry, uh, you know, for as long as possible, potentially, you know, you can intervene uh, sooner rather than later and delay diseases of aging and even delay aging. So uh, with that in mind, I put those two ideas together and decided to go back to school. Uh, my, my, college degree, my first college degree wasn't in science, it was in English literature, you know, studying Shakespeare and that stuff. So I had to go back to school to take all the science courses. So I went back for a uh, second bachelor's degree in, in biochemistry, and then, um, you know, started thinking about graduate schools where I could study aging. So um, what was hot at that time was actually the genetics of aging. I figured, you know, why not study uh, the genetics of aging? So um, <laughs> it's funny, uh, you know, so about 20 years ago, I, um, you know, and again, magazine, I picked up a magazine by uh, Life Ex the Life Extension Foundation. And in that magazine was a scientist named Richard Miller, who's still a scientist studying aging. And uh, I actually emailed him uh, and said, hey, I'm interested in studying aging or the genetics of aging. Uh, do you have any recommendations? So he said, hey, uh, you should think about uh, the University of Texas Health Science Center They've got these scientists, Arlen Richardson and Holly Van Remen, who are studying the oxidative stress theory of aging, which was very popular, you know, 20 years ago. So I looked into their PubMed, uh, you know, their publications, and I thought, wow, this is, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. So I put that at the top of my list. I made sure I got as almost as straight of a, as straight A's as possible in, in my undergraduate work so that I can get into their program, which I did. And then I ended up in Holly Van Remen's lab, again, like you said, studying the oxidative stress theory of aging. So uh, towards the end of, end of that, you know, with this uh, mentality of, you know, I want to study the biochemistry of aging uh, and not just the oxidative stress theory of aging, uh, because I still had this idea of, you know, the biochemical processes, uh, you know, underlying disease and aging. So um, with that in mind, I wanted to get into a, a more broader approach versus the, you know, what I was studying uh, as a graduate student, which was basically knock one gene out in terms of oxidative stress to increase it and look at the effects on muscle mass uh, during aging. So I wanted a broader perspective, a less reductionist uh, perspective. And with that in mind, I wanted to use a metabolomic approach, which is basically studying as many circulating metabolites uh, in blood. Uh, it can be in any, any you know, tissue or, or bodily fluid uh, in, in older adult humans. So um, that's what I did. I, uh, I joined Roger Fielding's lab who had uh, funding to study the uh, serum metabolome and as it related to uh, muscle mass and function in older adult humans. Uh, so I switched from Texas to Boston 
And uh, well, I think you have other questions, but that's how I ended up in the, uh, at least getting into my human studies, which we'll get into the microbiome stuff, I guess, in a bit. Thank you so much for sharing that journey with us. Um, let's move on into some of your research studies. Your current research focuses on the role of gut muscle axis in older adults. What is the role of the gut microbiome on muscle mass and function? Right, perfect segue. So I should say that I didn't care about the gut microbiome uh, about 10 years ago, which is when I came uh, to, or when I arrived in Boston from, from my graduate work in Texas. Uh, so in looking at the, the serum metabolome, uh, I started a, in, in, in the publications in, ter in terms of, uh, you know, the associations between the circulating metabolites with muscle mass and function in older adults, I started to see a pattern of many gut bacteria derived metabolites being associated with muscle mass and function in some cases positively and in other cases negatively. So certain bacterial metabolites that were uh, associated with better muscle mass and function and conversely the opposite. So with that in mind, I uh, wrote some grants and got a few of them funded to study the role of the gut microbiome and serum metabolome in older adults. And we published some of that work uh, last year. So um, since those initial studies um, that I just identified the role of the gut, you know, the gut bacteria metabolites in association with muscle mass and function, uh, it, this wasn't a very popular idea. Um, you know, about five years ago, which is when this, uh, you know, my interest in it basically uh, started. So there, there have been, there were studies, you know, um, about 13 years ago, uh, Fred Backhead uh, showed some data on lean mass in germ-free mice being higher, which suggested a role for the microbiome on affecting muscle mass. But um, there, since then, there were very few studies that looked at the gut muscle axis. And, and it's funny because in some of my presentations, uh, in 2017, you know, I put up a slide for data, a review paper published in 2017 for the gut, you know, the, uh, the, the role of the microbiome on uh, the health and functioning of various organ systems. And, you know, there was, there's, you know, on the, on the, on the slide, it's like, you know, the gut can affect adipose tissue, the brain, the liver, the kidney, but notably absent. And this is just three years ago was muscle mass, which comprises, you know, 40 to 60% of our, our, you know, body mass, almost half of our body weight. So, um, in 2019, I published a review paper, and I guess 2019 was uh, in a quote unquote an explosion of gut muscle papers. And that's helped to fill in more of the story on how the gut may affect muscle. Uh, so uh, just as a short, <laughs> short answer. Um, so there are certain gut bacterial metabolites called short chain fatty acids. These are uh, two, three, and four carbon fatty acids that have been shown to positively affect muscle mass and function. So if you give germ-free mice um, uh, these short chain fatty acids, they have better muscle, have more muscle mass and better physical function. Uh, now the question is, do they affect, can they affect, uh, muscle mass and function in older adult humans? And I'm in the process of going after grants right now to perform interventions to actively go after that. Um, now conversely, there are gut bacteria metabolites that negatively affect muscle mass and function. And these are primarily in in vitro studies and in animal studies with no data yet in older uh, animals or older adult humans, only correlations in the older adult humans. But some of those metabolites would be things that are known to be associated with decreased kidney function, including endoxyl sulfate, paracresyl sulfate, and others. So um, I've actually got a hypothesis that I've, I'm pitching in uh, some grant, sub grant submissions now that put those short chain fatty acids at the center of a mechanism that affects gut microbiome composition, uh, 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 gut pH, and then the uh, concentration of these negative gut bacteria metabolites. So long story short, more short chain fatty acids, better gut microbiome composition, less gut bacteria that produce these quote unquote bad metabolites like, that can affect muscle and other organs. Uh, and then so that systemically would, you know, be expected to improve various uh, health related measures. So fingers crossed, hopefully I can get those uh, grants funded and, and we'll see if it's actually true. Well, I definitely have my fingers crossed for you. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. Recently, you have been sharing a personalized data driven approach for optimizing biological age. Will you walk us through how you came to develop this approach and how it works? Yeah. So so I, uh, along the lines of my uh, initial interest in 
uh, studying my own biochemistry, um, you know, my own systemic biomarkers, things that are found basically on a standard chemistry panel when you go to a doctor's visit every year. So I, I've been tracking that for about 15 years, once a year, um, thinking, you know, as long as I'm tracking it and trying to intervene when I get my blood test, that, um, that, that'll be better than doing nothing for 50 years and ending up with disease. So about five years ago, I thought, you know, once a year isn't enough. Um, if, if I really want to figure out the impact of diet, exercise, and even potentially supplements on optim optimizing my own systemic biochemistry to minimize disease risk and maximize longevity, I've got to study myself more often. So since 2015, I've been blood testing four to six times per year. This year is going to be six times. Uh, I've, I've measured five times so far this year, uh, my blood tests. Uh, it'll be uh, six times in a couple of weeks after I measure it again. Um, so but with the thinking that with more measurements, with more data, the correlations between my diet or fitness components with my circulating biomarkers would become stronger. And in support of that, uh, you know, I've got now 25 plus blood tests in the past five years. And uh, there are some things in my diet that seem to very strongly affect certain biomarkers in the right directions and conversely others in the wrong direction. And with that in mind, I feel like I'm getting closer to a personalized diet that best optimizes my circulating biomarkers. Now there's something inherent in that, which is, okay, um, you know, uh, what's optimal for these biomarkers that you get on just the standard chemistry panel that you, when you go to the doctor and when you get your blood test results, you know, you're given the reference range. So the reference range are basically 90, you know, the population based averages where 95% of the population falls. So you can be in the range and getting worse over time, but still in the range which most people don't pay attention to. Even MDs aren't paying attention to that until you're either too high or too low. So, that, so that's part of the story. And then what's optimal within that range isn't, isn't determined either. I mean, it's just basically how do you compare against where the rest of the population is versus what's optimal for aging and disease. So for virtually all of the um, uh, quote unquote biomarkers that are found on the standard chemistry panel. I've done deep dives on, you know, in the literature to figure out how they change during aging, what's found in youth and how they change during, uh, with, uh, diseases in, in this case, all cause mortality risk, not just cardiovascular disease or cancer, but risk of death from, uh, from all causes. So with that in mind, then, you know, once I understand the why behind each of these biomarkers, I can, uh, know where they should be you know, in, as opposed to just where the reference range is. So a good example of that as just one example is uh, albumin, which most people completely overlook, but it's arguably one of the most important biomarkers, you know, maybe even more important than glucose. Um, so without going into why that's true, uh, it, it's, it, I just brought that up to illustrate that diet can optimize that. So uh, higher levels of albumin are found in youth, but albumin decreases during aging from values around five to values around three and a half, um, grams per deciliter. So, um, and, and, and old, you know, and that's in like centenarians. So, um, so how can you keep your albumin levels high? So, as I mentioned, you know, with those, uh, 25 blood tests or so over the past five years, I noticed a correlation between my beta carotene intake with albumin. So higher beta carotene, higher albumin. So, uh, but this isn't just a little bit of beta carotene. This is like 55 milligrams per day and which foods contain beta, uh, beta carotene, so carrots and orange sweet potatoes. But then the next issue is how much would you need to eat to get albumin levels that are what's found in a 20 year old. So for me, that's about a, a pound of carrots a day, whereas most people are eating one little baby carrot or two little baby carrots and thinks that think that that's vegetables. But uh, for me, you know, uh, that seems to optimize or it's correlated with biological youth levels of albumin. Another example of that is HDL. Um, so you know, there's a lot of data in the literature talking about drugs to increase HDL because uh, HDL levels in the 50s, mid 50s or so are associated with lowest risk of death for all causes for both men and women. So in my own case, uh, my HDL levels I, I had been as low as 28, which is about half of where they should be. So uh, I'm currently doing an experiment based on correlations in my data for uh, certain nuts and seeds that uh, higher levels of them are associated with higher LDL. So I'm, you know, I'm stacking my diet with them as opposed to just sporadically eating them when I feel like it with the goal of keep getting my HDL from about 45 on average to now around 55. So 
Um, using my approach, I feel like, uh, or I shouldn't say I feel like, using my approach and based on the data, I believe that I'll be able to, you know, slow my, dis uh, uh, slow diseases, you know, push that window out even further or delay it completely, maximize longevity. And, and uh, along those lines too, identify the diet that's optimal for me, not a, di a diet that ideologically I believe in, whether it's, I'm only going to eat meat or I'm only going to eat vegetables and, you know, uh, you know, vegans or carnivores or, you know, vegetarian. It's what does the data say? And then how can I use my diet to optimize the circulating data, which is, which is unbiased. Like I'm, you know, so that's, that's basically my approach in a nutshell. Thank you, Dr. Lesgarten. That was, that's fascinating um, work that you're doing. Thank you for sharing. We all know that this year has been an unprecedented one to say the least. How do you envision your work changing or adjusting in the future following this year? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, professionally, um, I hope I can get these uh, grants funded on the gut muscle axis. And I'm uh, in the, I've got two sub separate grants that are uh, in review right now, one of them looking at the impact of uh, soluble fiber on the gut muscle axis and the other on exercise training on the gut muscle axis, which basically hasn't been studied in older adults. So uh, hopefully I can get those funded so I can keep chipping away at the gut muscle axis, uh, you know, with the goal of optimizing the gut microbiome to improve these outcomes in, in older adults. Um, now, personally, uh, in terms of my own quantified self uh, approach, I, I expect to do that indefinitely, uh, regardless of what happens with my professional career as a scientist, because in science, you either get grants, start studies, publish those studies and stay in science or you don't. And it's not guaranteed. Right. So even though I've had success in getting some grants and doing studies, that doesn't mean it'll always be the case. I hope that's the case, but it doesn't mean it'll always be the case. Nonetheless, if it's not or even if it is. Uh, I, I expect to do my own quantified self studies indefinitely. I mean, for the next 50 to 80 years plus, uh, and I can do that easily uh, because there are companies that will send me blood test kits, uh, not just me, anyone that will order them. And then I can go to a, you know, certain labs and they'll draw my blood and I can get, get the blood analyzed. So I expect to make videos and, and report to the, the rest of the world, uh, you know, my progress or lack of progress or, or, you know, how it's going indefinitely. Um, and another reason I put all that data out there is because, you know, um, so I've said this before in presentations too. So once upon a time, the, the, the focus in fitness and health was eat real food and exercise. And a great example of that was Jack LaLanne, you know, so uh, for people who don't know, Jack LaLanne was like this fitness icon and that was his mantra. And, you know, he would say things like, I can't die. It'll be bad for my image. He thought he was going to live forever. And if you looked at his physique, I mean, he, at 70, he looked fantastic. But by the time he hit 95, I mean, it, you know, age caught him like it has, like it's caught everyone. So, uh, you know, I, I, I want to have a, a higher level to just eat real food and exercise. And I think, you know, by tracking uh, everything that I track, I think that's a higher level. So uh, I put it out there because just like Jack Lane put his approach out there, you know, um, hopefully, you know, so people like me saw that approach and thought, how can I make that approach better? Because 95 isn't, I, I respect that Jack Lane got to 95, you know, and he didn't have longevity genes in his family. His parents were dead by I think 70. So he extended his lifespan compared to them. And similarly, I don't have longevity genes in my family. If I'm gonna to get to 122, which is the world record for lifespan, I'm gonna to have to use every bit of science you know, like Matt, Matt Damon in The Martian, I'm going to have to science the out of aging. So um, I put my approach out there basically so that potentially people can see what I'm doing in all the different aspects, whether it's my blood test, my dietary tracking, my fitness tracking, uh, my, my, you know, my quantification of sleep and trying to optimize that. So people can look at me and say, wow, you know, you improved on Jack Lane's approach and you got to this age and you had this level of fitness and health, but I think you could have done this better. So I'm going to do that. So, uh, you know, it isn't just to put my approach out there. I also, ex you know, expect that there will be people my age or younger that will improve upon my approach. Now, I, I hope that they'll reach out to me so that I can improve upon my approach, my approach now, so that they're, they're not beating me to the punch, you know, and living to, you know, uh, longer than I am. You know, I hope they'll help me get to as far as I can get in terms of lifespan. But um, yeah, so I, I want to put my, my, my uh, story out there, but I also want to, you know, people to um, optimize their own existence, uh, you know, so that's part of the reason I put my, my story out there. So professionally and then personally, that's how I see 
uh, yeah, the future going in these directions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lestgarden, for spending some time with us, sharing your insight. Uh, we truly appreciate you and your time, and we certainly wish you well and, and stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you uh, speak at conferences to come. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you.